Dr. Stephanie Hack, the Lady Parts Doctor, and welcome back to the Lady Parts Doctor podcast. Last week, we talked about medical gaslighting. It also happened to be um, Black Maternal Health Week, and I thought that medical gaslighting was just a great topic to discuss because it affects so many vulnerable people, especially black women, um, and there were so many different stories that women had, women of all backgrounds about experiencing gaslighting in a medical situation, whether it be a doctor or a nurse or just some other kind of healthcare provider. And it's funny, and by funny I mean interesting, because once I put that post out, I started seeing more and more, and there was another podcast last week where an actress was detailing an experience she had with medical gaslighting with that podcast host and talking about just how she kept saying that there was a problem and she was having an issue after surgery and that no one believed her until her um, white husband came in. This was a black woman telling the story. So, you know, it's a big topic. It's an important topic. So it was good to just address it and keep the dialogue going as we like to do here at Lady Parts Doctor. This week is Infertility Awareness Week. And I recently received, actually just last week, a recommendation from someone about different topics. And one of those topics was infertility. So I thought, how perfect for us to be able to discuss it during Infertility Awareness Week. And I really struggled with how to broach the topic of infertility because to me, It seems like such a personal journey, like miscarriage. However, I recently shared my own history with miscarriage and encouraged you to do the same. So I think fertility and infertility should get the same treatment, right? I agree. I will tell you from experience, many people struggle with infertility or subfertility, and you don't even know. Sometimes they get pregnant on their own or with assistance, and sometimes they never get pregnant and they decide to adopt or live without children. Maybe they're the cool child-free couple you know who travel at the drop of a hat and you just assumed they never wanted kids. The point is, you just never know someone's dis, uh, someone's situation and how they make the decision to live their lives a certain way, which is another reason why this is related but unrelated. I think we should stop asking people if they want to have kids. It's such a common question to ask, especially if you can't really think of anything to ask or people just got married or they've been married a long time. You never know what their journey is. So continuing to ask people if they want kids, if they've been trying to have kids, and even if they aren't and they just don't want kids is just not a question people want to continue to ask. I have a hard time because as an OBGYN, I often want to ask people if they want more kids. I'm definitely guilty of that and I am a work in progress. So that's something we can work on together. In my research for this topic, I was really surprised by some of the opinions uh, that people had about people with infertility. And one opinion included a rant regarding people who state that they are, quote, suffering from infertility, end quote. The gist was that people are not actually suffering and to state so was part of just the general selfishness that leads them to seek infertility treatment instead of doing something like adopting or fostering. Well, I understand the logic Here in our safe place, we are discussing infertility and respecting one another's feelings about it, whether we agree with it or not. The desire to procreate is shared by many, and it's necessary that enough people have it for the survival of humankind. People suffering with infertility is not always limited to the ability to have children or inability to have children, I should say, but everything else that fertility entails, encompasses, you know, thoughts and feelings about ourselves, so on and so forth. Another thing, this is going to be a very binary discussion 
involving infertility between a heterosexual couple, male and uh, female. Even if that's not you, the information will still be helpful for understanding how our reproductive system functions and just the different options available to anyone who wants to become pregnant and maybe needs some assistance with fertility. Plus, it just, you know, like I said, might be helpful as you if you encounter any difficulties along your own journey to pregnancy and parenthood. So now that we have some common ground, let's keep going. How are black and indigenous people of color affected by infertility? As with many health issues, they are often faced with additional barriers to seeking and obtaining treatment for various reasons. In the U.S., many Black, Indigenous people of color, women grow up hearing stereotypes about their own group related to high rates of teenage pregnancy, hypersexualization, and hyperfertility. Often, as with many other things, they don't talk about their experiences, leaving these women with the impression that they are alone in this process or that infertility is a reflection of their character and ability to parent. And that just isn't so. Black and Latina women are less likely to seek fertility treatment than their white counterparts. And once receiving care, many find that clinics and providers lack cultural understanding. My goal through our discussion is to provide you, however you identify, with information to help you better understand infertility and feel equipped to address your concerns with your healthcare provider. I want you to be able to ask the right questions and provide the right information. You got this. Now, what is infertility? Infertility is the failure to achieve pregnancy within 12 months of unprotected intercourse, so sex without a condom, or therapeutic donor insemination in women younger than 35 years or within six months in women older than 35 years. Infertility affects 15% of couples and is further broken down into two categories, primary and secondary. Primary infertility means that they have never been pregnant. According to the CDC, about one in five heterosexual U.S. women between the ages of 15 to 49 who have never given birth are unable to get pregnant within one year. In other words, 19% have primary infertility. They also state that about one in four, so that's about 26%, 25%, women in this group have difficulty getting pregnant or carrying a pregnancy to term. Now, second inf- uh, secondary infertility refers to the inability to conceive a child or carry a pregnancy to full term after previously giving birth and is just as common as primary infertility. Well, how do you know if you're infertile? If you are under 35 years old and have been having unprotected sex for one year without pregnancy, or you are over 35 years old and trying for six months, Without getting pregnant, you might have fertility issues. What causes infertility? According to the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, about one third of infertility cases can be attributed to male factors. That's the male partner. And about one third to factors that affect women. The rest of infertility is caused by a combination of problems in both partners or uh, in about 20% of cases, it's unexplained. And I think that was something that I often had with my patients is a lot of times the infertility would be unexplained, which is often very frustrating for people because we just want an answer. We just want something that we can fix. Female causes are either structural or related to ovulation. Once you ovulate, the egg must travel from your ovary into your fallopian tube. So it gets swept up into your fallopian tube And then once it's in the fallopian tube, it will be fertilized by the the sperm, which are just like hanging out, waiting there, waiting for an egg. An ability to produce an egg or for the egg or sperm to travel through the uterus, fallopian tubes, or pelvis in general is going to prevent fertilization and thus pregnancy from occurring. Conditions like polycystic ovarian syndrome, that's, you know, in a case where women might not ovulate at all or ovulate regularly. 
um, thyroid disease, which can also affect ovulation, endometriosis, which can cause scarring that blocks an egg or a sperm from moving through the whole system like it needs to. Those can all cause female infertility, while issues with sperm size and shape, number and motion can cause male infertility. What happens during an infertility evaluation? Your health care provider will take a thorough thorough medical history from you. That's going to include questions about the amount of time you've been infertile, like how long have you been trying to get pregnant without success, Um, medical conditions that you've had now or in the past, previous pregnancies and all of them. We're going to want to know uh, any pregnancies that you took to term, any miscarriages you had, any terminations or abortions you had, all of that information is necessary. Contraceptives you've used in the past. For example, have you been on Depo-Provera, the shot? Because it can take a little while for your ovulation to return after using something like that. Your history of sexually transmitted infections or STIs and detailed information about your periods. Because we're really trying to figure out, are you ovulating, right? Is ovulation part of the reason that you're not getting pregnant? And so information about your periods is going to give us more information about that. They will also want similar information for your partner. And in addition, they're going to perform a physical exam. You will also need to complete testing to evaluate your ovarian reserve, which is basically the number of remaining eggs, your ovulatory function, and structural abnormalities within your pelvic organs, so your uterus, fallopian tubes, etc., ovaries. This includes blood draws to test your hormone levels, STI testing, tests for anemia, and immunity to certain infections. You're also going to have some imaging performed, uh, most likely through an x-ray called a hysterosalpingogram, HSG, if you've heard that term before. During this x-ray, dye is inserted into your uterus and observed spilling out of your fallopian tubes. And that's a great thing, like in real time, in the moment, they're taking multiple pictures and you can see the dye moving into the uterus from the cervix and then just making its way through the fallopian tubes. And it can show if a fallopian tube is blocked, which would prevent fertilization, right? Based on that whole pathway that we kind of went through before. And it can also give valuable information about the shape of the uterine cavity. Your provider may also recommend an ultrasound to view your uterus and ovaries. In addition to providing their medical history, male partners will need to perform lab work as well. They're going to need to give blood samples and urine samples to check for sexually transmitted infections, and they're also going to need to provide a semen analysis to check sperm number, shape, form, and motility. What are infertility treatments? And sorry, I'm clearing my throat because I'm just laughing and it's not really funny. But, you know, I feel bad for the guys in this situation because you think about getting like the sterile cup and having to go to some uncomfortable place and provide a semen sample. And that just like doesn't sound fun. Not to say that anything that women go through, I've had an HSG and that was also not fun. It wasn't the worst experience I've had, but I wouldn't sign up for another one if I like didn't need one. You know what I'm saying? Um, What are infertility treatments? Sometimes it's a matter of having sex at the right time. If you're having sex regularly, but never during the time that you could get pregnant, like you're not going to get pregnant. That's just how it is. I always like to review this with my patients. And as your health expert extraordinaire, I'm going to review it with you as well. To get pregnant, you need to have sex during your period of highest fertility, which is in the week leading up to ovulation. Most women ovulate about two weeks before your period starts. So if you have a 28 day cycle, you will likely ovulate around day 14. Like it could be day um, 13 to 16, but we're sticking with day 14. And day one is the day your period starts. If your period comes every 21 days, you will likely ovulate around day seven. And if your period comes every 35 days, you will probably ovulate on day 21. And how I'm getting that number is I am just saying how what your average cycle length is. So that would be like a period of 28 days and I'm subtracting 14 from that to get your day of ovulation. Hopefully that makes sense. Your goal is to have sex every day or every other day 
leading up to ovulation. And you really should have sex the day of suspected ovulation and the day after for good, me- uh, for good measure, you know, just in case you ovulated a little later than you think, or if your cycle just happens to be one or two days longer than the last cycle or your average cycle. Sperm can live inside the female body for up to five days. Okay. So, but the egg only lives about 24 hours. So timing is key. There need to be some sperm there when that egg makes its way into the fallopian tube, or it's just not going to happen. And, you know, you might be disappointed. If you've got the timing right, and there's still no pregnancy, it's time to see your healthcare provider and possibly a fertility specialist. You may need one of these treatments. One, ovulation induction. During ovulation induction, medications are given to stimulate the ovary to ovulate and release an egg. Then your goal is to have sex during your fertile time and with ovulation to try to conceive. Intrauterine insemination, also known as IUI. During that procedure, sperm are placed directly into the uterus at time of ovulation to attempt to fertilize the egg. Surgery. If you've been trying to get pregnant and maybe they see your healthcare provider sees something abnormal on your ultrasound, we'll say. There's sometimes structures such as uterine fibroids or polyps that are removed to facilitate pregnancy, as well as endometrial implants or pelvic scar tissue. These are things that would be in your um, in your pelvis and can cause a blockage and prevent the egg from making its way to the fallopian tube for fertilization. In vitro fertilization, IVF. This is something that I'm sure you've heard a lot about, especially if you've been researching infertility. The ovaries are stimulated with medication so that they produce multiple eggs. You want to get as many eggs as possible. These eggs are then retrieved through a procedure and then they are fertilized with sperm in a dish in a lab. Once fertilized, the embryos, which basically means the fertilized eggs, they're placed in the uterus several days after fertilization. And then the goal is to see if they implant, and they're usually only putting in one at a time. There are, you know, IVF um, is something that people commonly think of, whether it's expensive and it can be a lot of money, but often your insurance will cover some of it. And fortunately, a lot of times the reproductive uh, endocrinology and infertility specialists have programs to assist with that and make it just a little more accessible to everyone. The next uh, potential treatment would be donor egg or sperm. If there are severe problems with either your eggs or your partner's sperm or vice versa, you might decide to use uh, donor eggs or donor sperms or donor embryos from someone you know or from an anonymous donor. And that has proven to be quite successful for some people who want to carry a child. And even with using that donor eggs, if you're able to have an embryo, then they can place it in your uterus and you can carry it and have the experience of pregnancy um, that you want with your baby. A gestational carrier. If your uterus isn't functional, or carrying a child could be life-threatening, you might opt to place your embryo into someone else's uterus so they may carry the pregnancy for you. And examples of that, I think Kim Kardashian did that with one of her pregnancies. Um, If you are a Housewives of Atlanta fan, Candy um, Burris did that, I think with her last pregnancy. And so that is an option for people as well who want to get pregnant but can't carry a baby on their own for whatever reason. Some of these treatments have potential complications. They have complications just like everything in life, such as multiple pregnancies, which is being pregnant with twins or more, um, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, OHSS, in which hormones cause the ovaries to become painful and swollen and also cause some other like gastrointestinal side effects like abdominal bloating, abdominal pain, et cetera, et cetera. So if you opt to choose any of these options, you will be in close contact with your healthcare provider just to talk about how you're feeling and what you've been experiencing. 
how can I prevent infertility? There are some things that you can do to maximize your fertility. First, track your periods. Knowing your cycle length is going to help determine your fertility window and also helps you be sure that you're actually having sex at the right time. It can also determine if you have issues with ovulation. You know, if you see that your periods are like every 45 to 60 days, you might not be ovulating. Sometimes it can be even longer. So good to have a conversation with your healthcare provider about that once you have that information. Maintain a healthy body weight. 12% of all infertility cases are a result of the woman either weighing too little or too much. And I know we don't really like to talk about weight because we have a lot of feelings associated with that, but weight can affect fertility. And so that's something that you can do and try to manage to the best of your ability to give your fertility a boost. Stop smoking. Up to 13% of female infertility is caused by cigarette smoking. And the risk of miscarriage is higher for pregnant women who smoke. So if you want to be pregnant, stop smoking. Even if you don't want to be pregnant, like stop smoking. It's not really good for you. You know, I had to put my little plug in there. Use condoms in non-monogamous relationships and get tested regularly. And even monogamous relationships if you don't necessarily trust your partner, okay? Chlamydia causes about 4 to 5 million infections annually in the United States. And if left untreated, chlamydia can cause pelvic inflammatory disease, also known as PID, which can cause scarring in the fallopian tubes and pelvis and lead to, interfil- uh, and lead to infertility, basically just by preventing the egg from getting to where it needs to go to get fertilized. Uh, There are also just some other things. I know I gave that time window of one year of trying if you're under 35, but there are some people who just, if you know you have infertility risk factors or you suspect that you might have infertility, that might be waiting too long for you. Waiting three months might be too long for you. Waiting, waiting, waiting one month. If you know that you have severe like stage three or stage four endometriosis, you're probably going to need some infertility help right away. Or if you know that you have PCOS and you don't ovulate regularly, you're going to need some fertility assistance right away. So there are some conditions that you might have that you're going to need to seek treatment. And again, you know, this is just some basic information because I want you to have the vocabulary and I want you to have the understanding behind it as you seek treatment from your healthcare provider, just to better understand and ask the right questions. So this was a lot of information. And again, thank you for sticking through it. I hope you feel equipped to continue your journey. If you don't need this information right now, very good. Please pass it on to someone who um, who does need the information. As always, it has been a pleasure. Don't forget to, subscri- uh, to subscribe to the blog, the podcast, which is now on Apple, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon, but you can also access it from ladypartsdoctor.com. There's a YouTube channel. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, everything. You know, I'm just trying to get the message out and uh, promote evidence-based information in women's health care as much as I possibly can. As always, let me know if you have any questions, if you have any ideas for the show, stories, ideas. You can email me at drhack at ladypartsdoctor.com. Thanks for listening and until next time. Thank mm-hmm. you.